Welcome again. In this session, we are reading Acts chapter 3. The extension of Jesus' ministry begins in the apostles. Peter and John were going up into the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. That would be in our time, it would be about 3 p.m. A certain man who was lame from his mother's womb was being carried, who they laid daily at the door of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask gifts for the needy of those who entered into the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive gifts for the needy. Peter fastened his eyes on him with John, said, Look at us. He listened to them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, that I give you. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. He took him by the right hand and raised him up. Immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. Leaping up, he stood and began to walk. He entered with them into the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him that it was he who used to sit begging for gifts for the needy at the beautiful gate of the temple. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. As the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. When Peter saw it, he responded to the people, You men of Israel, why do you marvel at this man? Why are you amazed? Why do you fasten your eyes on us as though by our own power or godliness we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, Yeshua, whom you delivered up. Notice, he, again, they're basically attacking whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had determined to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead to which we are witnesses. You know, a lot of pastors today, if they were in the place of Peter and John with all the people running to them and clamoring around them, like, wow, you know, you you, you healed somebody. Wow. And a lot of pastors today or preachers or evangelists today would be going, like, oh, yeah, yeah wow, wow, look at me, you know, praise God. You know, come up here and testify and we'll show everybody what God did through me. You know what I mean? But, you know, Peter and John, instead of just soaking in the attention and the praise, they attacked the. They were like, "You crucified! You're the one that denied the holy and the righteous one." Wow! I mean, they were not afraid of offending them. Verse sixteen: By faith in His name, His name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which is through Him has given Him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now, brothers, I know that you did this in ignorance, as did your rulers. Note this, and I've said this before. The cross is the inversion of the tree of knowledge. What happened in the Garden of Gethsemane and in Jerusalem was an inversion of what happened in the Garden of Eden and the tree of knowledge. Put it this way. Eve was tempted by the devil to take the fruit off the tree. Okay? Now we know, according to the scriptures, the cross is also called the tree. You know, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You know, it talks about how Jesus hung on the tree. Okay? But notice also that Jesus is also called the fruit, the first fruits of God, the fruit of God, Jesus. Okay? So Jesus is the fruit. The cross is the tree. Just as Satan tempted Eve to take the fruit down off the tree, Satan came back to the tree, the cross, and said, if you're the Son of God, come down. Satan, the devil, wants you to come off the cross. The devil does not want you to sacrifice your selfish desires, your selfish ambitions. 
yourself. The devil is calling the fruit down off the tree, just like how he did with Eve. It says that Eve looked at the fruit, that it was pleasant to the eyes, good for food, and desirable to make one wise. Now we know that Jesus wasn't pleasant to the eyes when he was hanging on that tree. If you know the scriptures, he was not clothed at all. There was not one stitch of clothing on him. They ripped his clothes off. They whipped him. They beat him. They mocked him. They tore him apart. It says that they plowed his back. His back became like a farmer's field. They plowed it. They plowed it with their instruments of torture. They ripped his beard out. They really brutally beat him. When he was hanging on the cross, it actually says in Isaiah that he could not even be recognized. Okay? So no, he was not pleasant to the eyes to look at. He wasn't good for food either. It wasn't like a fleshly thing. No one was lusting after him at that point in time. Okay? And notice this. It was for knowledge that Eve pulled the fruit off the tree. God inverted that by saying it's by ignorance you put the fruit back on the tree. Let's look at this one more time. Peter made it very clear. It's by ignorance that that fruit was put back on the tree. Peter says again, Now, brothers, I know that you did this in ignorance, as did also your rulers. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Meditate upon this, okay? Meditate upon this. Jesus on the cross is the inversion of the fruit on the tree. It was in the garden that it started in the Garden of Eden. It was in the garden that it started with Jesus, the Garden of Gethsemane. There's lots of different parallels here. Meditate upon this. This is glorious. Verse 18, But the things which God announced by the mouth of all his prophets... Check that out. All his prophets that Messiah should suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again. Notice, Peter, the first message he preached in the book of Acts, he said, repent. Okay? The second message he preached, the second sermon, he said, repent. This is the common thread that is woven throughout all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation and then some. Okay? Repentance is the common thread. It's the first message that Jesus preached. It's the last thing he said to his church in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. It's the first thing the apostles preached when Jesus was walking this earth. It's the first thing they preached here in the book of Acts. If your church does not preach repentance regularly, get out. Get out. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. I just want to make it very clear what repentance is. Repentance is change, changing things, changing your mind to begin with, which means changing your life, turning around a 180, okay, turning 180 degrees. It is a 180 turn. It's changing your life. You used to live like this. You used to think like this. Now you live like that, and now you think like that. You used to hold these kind of values. Now you are against those. You hold these other values. You used to run with the world. Now you are walking with God. Okay? Completely different worlds. From black to white. From sin to righteousness. From death to life. That's what repentance is. If people do not see it in you, if people do not see that you are different, then you haven't repented. Once again, repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. This implies that if you don't repent, your sins won't be blotted out. And that's clear also in the scriptures. Very, very clear. Repentance is necessary. Repentance is necessary. First comes repentance, then comes mercy. Do not expect God to blot out your sins if you don't repent first. So that there may come times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. This is the key to revival. You know, you hear a lot talking about revival or renewal. Times of refreshing 
from the presence of the Lord. Don't we all want that? But this is all predicated. This is all conditional on repentance. This is why so many revivals die off. They get focused on other things other than repentance. God is like, no, listen, this is the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing here. Repentance. If you miss that, if you lose perspective there, God will just quietly walk out. And like Samson, you won't even know he's gone. Verse 20, and that he may send Christ Jesus, who was ordained for you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God spoke long ago by the mouth of his holy prophets. For Moses indeed said to the fathers, The Lord God will raise up a prophet for you from among your brothers. This is among the Jewish people. Like me. Notice again, this is a very, very key phrase here. Look at this. Like me. Like who? Moses said. The Lord will raise up a prophet. Obviously speaking here about Jesus, about Yeshua. Like me. See, so many people in the Christian world today, they look at Moses and Jesus as almost like two opposite two opposite beings. Like Moses is the law and Jesus is grace. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. It's not the case at all. God gave his Torah by his grace. He loved his people so much. He gave them his precepts, gave them his ordinances, gave them his commands, gave them his testimonies, gave them his judgments, gave them his word. God so loved his people that he showed them the way through guidelines, instructions, commands, and laws. Okay? If God didn't care, okay, if there was no grace, he wouldn't give any commands. He'd say, y'all go to hell. Y'all just be cursed. No, he loved his people. He had grace upon his people enough to give the law through Moses. So Jesus, the real, true, biblical Jesus here. We're not talking about the golden calf Jesus that we have today in most churches. We're talking about the real, true Jesus of the Bible is like Moses. Like Moses. In fact, Jesus said He's so much like Moses. There's one time he said to the people, you search the scriptures, obviously including the scriptures written by Moses. You search them thinking that in them alone you get life, but those scriptures speak of me. You want to know what Jesus was like? Read the Torah. You want to know what Jesus thought about certain things? Read the Torah. Jesus is the word. The Torah is the word. Jesus is the word in human form, in the flesh. The Torah is the word of God. So Jesus is the Torah in human flesh. There's nothing that Moses wrote that does not reflect Jesus. Especially when Moses said, thus saith the Lord. Because we know when Moses said, thus saith the Lord, that is what came out of the mouth of God. And that is what Jesus is. He is the word of God. The words that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Moses continued by saying, You shall listen to him in all things, whatever he says to you. And may I add, he was a Jewish rabbi as well. And as a Jewish rabbi, as any good Jewish rabbi, he taught the Torah. He taught the law. He expounded on it. He actually drove it deeper in people's hearts and lives. Verse 23, It will be that every soul that will not listen to that prophet, speaking of Jesus, will be utterly destroyed from among the people. And that is found in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 and verses 18 through 19. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who followed after, as many as have spoken, they also told of these days. You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, All the families of the earth will be blessed through your offspring. Genesis chapter 22 verse 18 and chapter 26 verse 4. God having raised 
up his servant Jesus, sent him to you first to bless you in turning away every one of you from your wickedness. Turning every one of you from your wickedness. That is the message of the book of Acts. Once again, if you don't have that message, if you don't hear that message preached in church, get out. Get out. Just a so-called religious social club. It's just a club, probably more or less a club of hypocrites, may I say. Seek God while he may be found. And if you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. Keyword, all your heart. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things, I promise you. Love you guys.